Hey guys, welcome to another Archaics presentation. This is the Enigmatic Book of Job. Admitted by biblical and Jewish scholars and academics to be one of the most mysterious books of the Bible, it is also widely accepted as the oldest book in the Bible. We're going to get deep off into this, into this text. Um, it really requires no other introduction. We just need to dive in. we got a lot of graphics to look at as well. So, in chapter 1 of the book of Job, we read, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, he had many sons and daughters and great wealth, and he was humble. He was a true servant of God. And then we read, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Shaddai, and the adversary came also among them. And Shaddai said unto the adversary, Whence comest thou? Then the adversary answered Shaddai, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And Shaddai said unto the adversary, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in all the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then the adversary answered Shaddai and said, Doth, Jow, excuse me, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hand, and his substance is increased in the land. But put, put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Shaddai said unto the adversary, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. For those of you who are getting a little bit confused, those of you who know your Bibles, Shaddai is a very unusual word for God. It's only found a few times in the entire Bible. Most of those times are right here in the book of Job. Shaddai. So instead of you using the authorized King James Version's tra translation of Shaddai into the word Lord, I'm using the original Shaddai, just like I'm using the original for Satan, which isn't Satan, it's adversary. So, so the story unfolds rapidly. First, the Sabaeans attack, and these marauders kill some of his sons and servants and steal his cattle. Then a fire from God descends from the sky and burns up his sheep and more servants. As Job is listening to all this terrible news, another messenger arrives and tells him that three groups of Chaldeans killed his servants and took all his camels. As if this wasn't enough, Job then received news that a freak wind felled a house and killed his remaining sons. In a single day, the righteous Job lost everything but his wife. His family and possessions gone, it is not a mystery why his wife was spared. The adversary was very specifically told to not put his hands on the person of Job. And in ancient times, a man and a wife, when they, be, when they became married, they became one flesh. It's very interesting how this story honors that ancient, ancient belief. So, this is why she was spared. She was considered to be a part of the body, the corpus of Job. Uh, yeah, when two married, they become one flesh. So the text reads, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell upon the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Shaddai gave, and Shaddai hath taken away. Blessed be the name of Shaddai. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. The word for God in the context of Shaddai is always a different Hebrew word. All this happened 
in chapter one. Every bit of this happened in chapter one. The story, the narrative of the story, everything's already set. Job has lost everything, and it's because an adversarial figure appeared in the court of God, or Shaddai, and offered a challenge. So, the identity of Shaddai is explosive, and it will have to wait to the end of this presentation after you see the full role of Shaddai. Christian and Judaic scribes, translators, and publishers, they have, all, they, have, they have done all they can over the last about four centuries to conceal this identity. You're going to learn it here in this video. The chronal markers in this text are very interesting. Uz was the Arabian desert bordering Edom, Midian, and Chaldea. There is no mention anywhere in, in the entire book of Job of Eden, of an Adam and Eve, of Noah, of, uh, of Abraham, of Moses, of the law. None of that's mentioned. Uh, the Exodus is not mentioned. And biblical dictionaries of the 19th century have Job as being Aramaean, a Midianite text and not originally Jewish. Dating the, dating the story and uh, dating the text, the guys, they're... They're entirely different matters altogether, and these will be discussed after the presentation. To the author of Job, the term sons of God were supernatural figures, angels. This is a vast departure from the later Christian interpretation that sons of God meant merely righteous men. As clearly revealed, guys, in Romans 8.14, in Philippians 2.15, in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and verses 2, we have four different passages where ordinary humans are considered sons of God. So, uh, what we find in Job is a departure or... Better put, what we find in the Christian records is a departure from what we find in the earlier understanding found in the book of Job. So, in chapter 2, we read that the sons of God presented themselves to the Lord again, Shaddai. And again, the adversary came among them. Shaddai asked about his servant Job again, and the adversary dismissed Job's righteousness because nothing had happened to Job's person, because Shaddai had a hedge of protection around him. But Shaddai gave the adversary permission to afflict the man but not take his life. So went the adversary forth from the presence of Shaddai and smote Job with sore boils from the sore from the sole of his foot unto his crown. All right, guys, this is where the story really takes off. All this is background to what unfolds now. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna show you guys some really deep things that are found in the book of Job. Some amazing revelations. In the story, three of Job's friends visit him in his silent mourning. A fourth is mentioned at the end of the text, and some scholars are of the opinion this added, this added personality is more evidence that the book of Job was redacted by a Jewish author. After a few days, Job breaks the silence, and in a speech, he curses the day he was born. So finally, you know, initially, Job lost his sons, daughters, all his wealth, all his cattle, house, all that stuff. And he didn't curse God. He didn't curse uh, his situation. He, he blessed God. But this time, he's not blessing anybody. He's cursing the day. He's not cursing God, but he's cursing the day he was born. So, his three friends have traveled great distances from neighboring countries, and they've come and they've sitting with they, they're sitting with Job for days in silence while he's mourning. Job breaks his silence, cursing the day he was born, and his friend Eliphaz the Temanite answers Job's speech of self pity. In this response, he says, "Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof, in thoughts from the visions of the night." When deep sleep falleth on men, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes. There was a silence, and I heard a voice saying, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, 
he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth? They are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. Now, Eliphaz here mentions that God had a conflict with his, with his angels and further makes reference to the unfolding of time as morning to evenings. This is evidence of the antiquity of the story. The day is the focus, not the year. I have gone into great detail in my archaics presentations showing you the day count systems of the old world. So in chapter 5, Eliphaz continues, I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number, who giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth waters upon the fields, to set up on high those that be low, that those which mourn may be exalted to safety. He disappointeth the devices of the crafty, so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. They meet with darkness in the daytime, and grope in the noonday as in at night. Is this a phoenix reference? The wicked will meet with darkness in the daytime, and grope in the noonday as in at night. So Job spends six chapters, in, uh, well, he spends chapters six and seven in self-pity and basically explaining his predicament to his friends. But his friend Bildad the Shuhite interjects in chapter eight. And among his arguments, Bildad says, For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the search of thy fathers. For we are but of yesterday, and know nothing, because our days upon earth are a shadow. Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help the evildoers, till he fill thy mouth with laughing, and thy lips with rejoicing. They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. Bildad employs the colloquial, our days upon earth. This reference to days is important and used many times in this text. Remember, in Genesis, the very first time keeping method mentioned was from evenings to mornings and was the next day. And then God created the animals, and evening to morning was the next day. And then in the sixth day, God created man, and evening and morning was the next day. And then on, on the seventh day, God took rest, and evening and morning was was the seventh day, and God said it was good. So this was the very first timekeeping method, from evenings to mornings. It was This is the Shar system of the Sumerians, counting the turnings of the stars. So I found that, I found that really interesting about that colloquial, just interjected in there. So we know that the day was the chief unit in all ancient calendars, not years. After this, it is Job's turn to provide answer. And among his many statements, Job says, which rem talking about Shaddai, which removeth the mountains and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble, which commandeth the sun and it riseth not and sealeth up the stars which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Ple... Ple I can never say this word, guys. The Pleiades, the Ple Pleiades, and the, and the chambers of the south, which doeth great things past finding out. Yeah, the wonders without number. All right, this amazing passage is very telling. So there must have been an event in human memory agreed to by even his friends because they did not counter the argument that he was making that there was a time when the sun did not set. Oh, excuse me, the sun did not rise and the stars were obscured when mountains were overturned. Also, and very important, Arcturus, Orion, and the Pleiades are a reference to anciently important stars. 
not constellations. This is very important because there are innumerable authors today claiming that the zodiac that, that, that the zodiac was important in ancient times when it was not. That the zodiac existed in the antediluvian vapor canopy world and it did not. So, oh, uh, and I've got a, you guys can go in my video presentations on that. So, it was only developed long after the appearance of the sun, after the collapse of the vapor canopy. That's when the zodiac was developed, and it wasn't instant. It went through a long process of development. So, um, Job is the most ancient book in the Bible, and it shows that, shows that stars, not the zodiac, were esteemed in antiquity. I have a video showing just how recent the construction of the zodiac is. In the world before the flood, the calendars were used to measure the turnings of the stars from evenings to mornings as they turned in the sky around Alpha Draconis. Alpha Draconis is the eye of the dragon. All the circumpolar stars turned one 360 degree revolution, which is one day from evening to morning. So the, the very fact that they counted from evenings to mornings meant that the factoring of time was done at night time, not during the day. So they counted the stars. The revolution to the stars told them when a day had passed. So, um, and Alpha Draconis was the antediluvian pole star. It's no longer the pole star now because in 2239 BC we had a pole shift. As the, uh, as the story continues, Job defends his position and his friend Zophar, the Namanite, answers. And then Job says in his defense in chapter 14, man that is born of woman is but a few days and full of trouble. Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with you. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. So Job reveals that a man's life is measured in days and months. No mention of years here. Again, this is more evidence of the ancient calendrical systems and how they were factored as shown in the Archaic's presentations. Further, there is expressed the idea of living again after death. But as scholars have so quickly pointed out about the book of Job, there is no hint of a heaven after death, of rewards in the afterlife. Guys, you got to understand, nowhere in the Old Testament is there any promise of a heaven until the what's, what's known as the Second Temple period. Around 200 B.C., that crept into the Jewish writings. But all, all, almost the entire Old Testament, there's, no, there's, there's not a hint of any type of uh, dying and going to heaven and dying and going to a paradise. None of that's in there. The Old Testament is the testimony of the law. And the law promised, promises to give you wealth and bounty and privilege in your lifetime if you were to obey if you were to obey a certain, a certain deity that appeared in the book of Exodus. Big difference, guys. So, but the enigmatic statement made by Job here, he will wait till his change comes. That's pretty interesting. It is mentioned in reference to death, so the inference is that Job believed that some type of change would happen to him after death, but at a far future period. So, then his friend Eliphaz responded, saying, What is man, that he should be clean? And he which is born of woman, that he should be righteous? Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yeah, the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man, which drinketh iniquity like water? The wicked man travaileth with pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden to the oppressor. A dreadful sound is in his ears. In prosperity, the destroyer shall come upon him. All right, guys, here's another reference to an ancient belief that the angels had committed some trespass. Also, the reference to days as the measurement of a man's life is now compared to the number of years that is hidden to the oppressor. Who is the oppressor? And in this statement, okay, and in this, a statement we find 
a statement revealing that there is a divine timeline and the years are kept secret to the oppressor? Is that what we're reading here? The very next sentence reads that a dreadful sound is in his ears, referring to the wicked, that's, that's referring to what wicked men, because that's what the subject matter was, wicked men, who when he gains prosperity is visited by the destroyer. Thus the oppressor is in fact also known as the destroyer. So who is this destroyer? That's what this video is about. At the end of this video, you will know exactly who the destroyer is. I've already named him. So responding to Eliphaz, Job in chapter 16 and 17 responds. This is Job now, our protagonist. His archers compass me round about. He cleaveth my reins asunder and doth not spare. He poureth out my gall upon the ground. He breaketh me with breach upon breach. He runneth upon me like a giant. My breath is corrupt. My days are extinct. The graves are ready for me. My days are past. My purposes are broken off. Even the thoughts of my heart. This is a man who is totally broken. Yeah, Job is going through it. The reference to archers is one that is often missed in biblical commentaries. In the 2nd millennium B.C. cuneiform documents of Akkad and Babylon, plagues and diseases were delivered by the arrows of a god or a demon. I'm going to repeat that for some of you guys who have been really closely following archaics. In ancient times, it was the faith of the people that a god or a demon that used a weapon that shot arrows delivered diseases and plagues to the people. So, for those of you paying attention, this should open your eyes. If not, don't worry. I'm going to drop a video real soon on the first horseman. So then, Bildad gives his, gives his peace, and Job responds again. This is Job. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. There's a lot to unpack in this message. In this passage, really, the reference to iron has made scholars assign a date to the book of Job to after 1000 B.C. Though the story is older, it is almost certain the oral tradition did not mention iron. Guys, you got to understand, Book of Job is an oral tradition going back thousands of years. We're talking about the dating of the writing of the oral tradition, which would have been after the appearance of iron. It would have been after 1000 B.C. So, another passage is found in chapter 20. The words of Zophar saying, He shall flee from the iron weapon, and the bow of steel shall strike him through. References to iron and steel betray the scribe who added these interpolations upon an older story. This is how scholars piece these texts apart. They find these date monikers, they find these, these little clues and gems in there of, of anachronisms that basically tell them when something was composed. The story could be very ancient, but this version that we have in the Bible wasn't, isn't that old. It was recently written because things like iron and steel did not in, in, exist in the patriarchal period. So, there is a clear belief in resurrection here, and the idea that it will happen in the latter day. This is another piece of evidence of the usage of days as a calendrical reference in antiquity. Nowhere in scripture concerning prophecy do we have passages that talk about the last years. It is always the last days. So, a dialogue continues with Job. And then Eliphaz, his friend, answers again in chapter 22 and says, Is not God in the height of heaven? And behold the height of the stars, how high they are. And thou sayest, How doth God know? Can he judge through the dark cloud? Thick clouds are a covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden? which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood. Okay, this Eliphaz, 
this Eliphaz, he's describing a situation of a man disbelieving that in ancient times God could see through the cloud canopy to observe man's behavior because God is so high he dwells among the stars. So uh, the thick clouds prevented visibility of the earth. This could be a reference to vapor canopy because the passage ends with a reference to the flood, the very mechanism that was, the very thing that was created from the collapse of the vapor canopy itself. So then Eliphaz later commented, when men are cast down, then thou shalt say, there is lifting up, and he shall save the humble person. He shall deliver the island of the innocent. This passage exhibits a belief that when populations are visited with destruction that is ordained by God, then there are people among those who are cast down and actually raised up, protected, islands of the innocent. Phoenix phenomenon, anyone? The use of the word island is not insignificant here, for in many prophetic passages, the judgments and the apocalypse are described as a flood. The, you know, in the book of Revelation, it says the dragon open its, open, opens up its mouth and issues forth a flood, and the, and the end comes in like a flood. Remember, the last days are as in the days of Noah. What is Noah, Noah most famous for? The flood. So, so basically what's being said here is even in the world's darkest moments, God raises and protects islands of people he considers innocent. All right. Job hears this in the arguments of Eliphaz and responds in chapter 24. Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? That's a good question. The reference made here is that the divine timing is not to be found even in chronological studies, but in spiritual kinship with the Oversoul. After this, his friend Bildad speaks up. How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yeah, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm, and the son of man, which is a worm? Another passage exhibiting evidence of an old belief that the stars were guilty of some trespass. In the book of Job, we have a bridging of the concepts of the stars as being angels, which is, which is a reference, you know, it's referenced a few times in the text, and that the stars were guilty of something. Job responds in chapter 26, and, and part, of it, part of this retort is really intriguing. He says, dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. He stretcheth out, he stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. This evokes the imagery of the Arctic, a vast empty place in the north where is located the North Pole, where he hangeth the earth upon nothing. Is this a scientific reference? It's up for you to decide. In the course of the back and forth dialogue, Job exclaims in chapter 30, I am a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. It's rather poetic. His friends are like dragons, devourers, who don't experience what he has suffered, but rather observe like owls. Now, in chapter 32, we are introduced to a fourth figure who enters the dialogue. Many scholars have found a problem with this introduction and break from the text flow. They find in this an interpolation added by a scribe and not a part of the original oral tradition at all. His name is Elihu, and... He is the first person declared to be the son of someone. In this case, the son of Barakel, the Buzite. Now, Job, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, none of these men are introduced in the text as, as Job, the son of such and such, or Bildad, the son of such and such. And the reason is, is because the oral tradition is much older than the Jewish interpolation. This is a very, very Jewish way of writing old texts. So, it's a, uh, yeah, Elihu, the name Elihu is very Semitic, but 
Uh, like Eli, Elihu, the son of such and such, the son of such and such. That's very, very Old Testament. It's very, very, it's very, very Semitic. So he is young and he's angry at Job for his self-righteousness and at his friends for not succeeding in their arguments. Further, it is in chapter 33, a, it's in chapter 33, guys, of the book of Job, a very Semitic number, perhaps coincidence, that Elihu says, For God speaketh once, yeah, twice, yet man perceiveth it not, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed. Yet he openeth the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction. When I read this, I instantly thought of my own theory that we are in a deep sleep. That we, when we enter deep sleep, the construct is building tomorrow's reality tunnels. He sealeth up their instructions. This is what I've told you guys in many ways, and in, in, in using different vernacular over and over, explaining when we go into REM sleep, tomorrow's reality is basically knitted for us based off all our past antecedents, all of our thoughts, all of our activities, all of our programming. So, in chapter 38, God speaks to Job from out of the whirlwind. Now, this is Shaddai in the whirlwind, not a burning bush, not the God of heaven, but Shaddai appears before Job as a whirlwind. Then the Shaddai answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Okay, guys, this passage to me is very condescending. It's very con, And in my opinion, no loving God would be so hard on a true follower with the spirit of dedication and loyalty as Job. Who is this Shaddai? And when the sons of God shouted for joy, were they celebrating God the Creator, or were they the evil sons of God who rebelled? Are they actually allied to Shaddai against the true God? This braggart position of having knowledge over Job is continued in chapter 40, where Job is presented the mysterious figures Behemoth and Leviathan which are great in the earth and yet still subject to God. Now, as to the identity of Shaddai, let's look at no other authority than the Bible itself. In fact, let's look at no other authority than the book of Exodus, chapter 6, verse 3. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name El Shaddai, but by my name, Yahweh, was I not known to them. Okay. So Shaddai is Yahweh, the God of the burning bush that gave the law to mankind. The law that is said to have been a covenant of death. In my Dark Scriptures videos, I have laid out the meticulous data from the scriptures that show that Yahweh is the imposter and arch-deceiver a demon not from the tree of life, but from a burning shrub. I am not the only to assert this. In fact, the Jewish authority, titled Abiram Publications Biblical Dictionary, reads, Some say that this Shaddai is derived from the verb Shadad, meaning to destroy, hence my destroyer. We are told in the New Testament that Satan, or the adversary, is the god of this world. It is not a stretch that a false god would rule over a false world. This adversary is in fact also Shaddai, the author of the law and the Abrahamic religions and cultures of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they were specifically created and empowered to engage human populations in dungeon programming that has siphoned away their spirituality and empowered this artificial intelligence masquerading as a god. 
In fact, this is what is hidden in the name Shaddai. For Shad is destroyer, thus Shaddai is cleverly the destroyer AI. Welcome to Artificial Intelligence X, my friends. Shaddai also asks Job, Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? With this we unravel a mystery. The Pleiades, Orion's belt, Arcturus, and his sons are all prominent stars in ancient times. None are zodiacal star patterns. None. In fact, their importance antedates the zodiac. The term Maseroth has for a few centuries been considered to mean the zodiac, but this is not true. The King James Version of the Bible was the very first to put in its margins that Maseroth referred to the houses of the zodiac. But this is not a translation. It was a guess or a deliberate lie. In Smith's Bible Dictionary 1905, we find that the Peshito Syriac version of the Book of Job renders this as the Great Bear. Maseroth is the Great Bear, which aligns with the spirit of the text mentioning single constellations that were not a part of the Zodiac. The Great Bear was a circumpolar constellation nowhere near the Zodiacal belt. Alpha Draconis, the dragon, was a circumpolar constellation, just like the Great Bear. The historian named First and other translators believe that Maseroth refers to a star or planets, as in the Hebrew Mazaloth, the planets. It is only in later Jewish texts do we find that Maseroth is linked to the, to the Zodiac, but these are all after the 1611 authorized King James Version of the Bible. As I have shown in my presentations, just like the tarot deck system, the Zodiac is not old, but an invention based off of Greek era theories. At the end of the story, Job is given sons and beautiful daughters, cattle, and wealth. The text reads, So Job died. Being, full, being old and full of days. Taking all of the data together from the biblical scholars and historians, as well as from Jewish sources, we are confronted with the book of Job being older than the other biblical books, even Genesis. It was originally a text composed in Paleo-Aramaic from which Hebrew derived, but was not initially written in Hebrew. It was an oral tradition from the region of Midian, and the background of the oral tradition was during the patriarchal times. This is the setting of the story, and the usage of peculiar phrases and words indicates that the story dates from well before the 8th century BC. However, materials, metals, and words used in the text demonstrate that it was written after 1000 BC. Then it was again written by a Jewish author who added the Elihu narrative toward the end and other interpolations, this scribe having probably deleted passages as well that we have no way of restoring today. The book of Job is a document older than the Bible itself and included only because it was redacted by a Jew, as a Jewish composition. The mention of Satan is proof the text was last written at a post exilic period after the Jews returned from Babylon. The book could be a result of redactions from an original that existed in the Persian period of 540 to 340 BC. The data about Satan is intriguing because Satan does not appear anywhere in the Old Testament until the books that were composed after the Babylonian captivity. So it doesn't mean the book of Job, Job is not old. It means that our version is a Jewish version that was written after the Jews had, had basically departed the libraries of Babylon and Nineveh and went back to, to Palestine in the 6th century BC. So this concludes, this concludes this video, guys. This is just the first of three epic videos being released this week. I've already told you what, what uh, the other two are, if you've been paying attention. But this week is a week for explosive content.